Hey everyone! So I just got back from VegFest London. It was an absolute action-packed weekend. One of the highlights of the weekend was getting to know Roger Yates. Now I've been following Roger's work for about a year, but this was our first time meeting face-to-face. -face. Now what you're about to see is a talk he and I had at the end of the event. He was such a good sport. He let me grill him after a full-on weekend. I think he did two talks, two panels, maybe more. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, Roger. Now you'll notice the format's a little bit different than my other videos. I'd like to say this is because I was getting creative, but the truth is, as Roger might say, I fecked it and the camera is out of focus. It turns out Canon and I have a slightly different definition of what autofocus means. Apparently autofocus doesn't mean it automatically focuses when you're shooting a video. So to help remedy this, the video is a bit smaller, however I put lots of information around the outside that's hopefully helpful. It includes what topics are going to be coming up next, so if you want to, you can always skip ahead. Be sure to stick around for the end, where there's some hilarious bloopers, and things get a little bit heated. What do you think, Roger? Did things get a little bit heated? I thought they may have gotten a little bit heated. I'll also share a few closing thoughts towards the end. With that, let's go ahead and get into it. I'm here with uh, Roger Yates, and we just finished uh, VegFest London 2019. Yeah. What did you think about it? It was good. Yeah, I um, I tend to see it as a kind of a, a conference with a VegFest. I, I, that's the way I kind of see it. Because level three is really like, I mean, if you just came into level three only, it would look like a conference. Mm -hmm. So I really love that. What does animal rights mean to you, and how do you think we should advocate <laughs> for them? Well, animal rights for me, I, I, use, I use a phrase called rights-based animal rights in order mm. to, to focus that. And I also, I, I can resent that because you, I shouldn't have to say that, right? But, but you do, uh, on the grounds that um, one of the points I made in one of the talks or panels was that uh, our movement is a bit philosophically messy. Mm. And, it, and it had a kind of like difficult kind of birth in that sense, theoretically, because we've got the situation of, um, going back to my generation, we've got you know, people like Peter Singer, and then we've got Tom Reagan. And uh, Peter Singer kind of came first, got in there first, uh, with animal liberation in the 1970s, um, and that was that was a fairly kind of easy to read book, and mm. it was groundbreaking in that time. And then you got Reagan, who is credited with getting the idea of rights over the species barrier, and so academics credit him with that. But Reagan's work is much more kind of philosophically dense mm. than, than Singer's, and so I think the movement didn't react too well to Reagan, apart from about three or four years, maybe, maybe half, a, half a decade in, in, mm. in, the, in the USA, you know, they, there is a kind of story that um, by the time they got round to the um, 1990 uh, march in Washington, March for Animals it was called, and the, I mean, Reagan himself reckons there were about 60,000 people there, you know, for, the, for this march, and he said that he thought that was kind of around about the time of the birth of the animal rights movement, but it kind of fizzled out. Mm. And there's a, an argument that, um, if you like, the animal welfare corporations that are still kind of around, if you like, well, that's a contentious word, they kind of reasserted their control over a movement that they were losing control of. Mm -hmm. So that seems to be it. So, you know, for me, if I say animal rights in one sentence, it's that other animals have rights, they are rights bearers or rights holders, and that when we use them, when humans use other animals, that's a rights violation. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's animal rights. And I, I really enjoy following your work because I think to me, if someone doesn't know how to get started talking about rights with others, obviously study the, um, the key influencers such as Reagan. Mm -hmm. However, I think just saying rights violations is a great way to start because it brings the conversation back to rights. But yeah. it's interesting though, um, I mean, all, all your viewers could do this. Look at any speech you know, look, look at any, any book you know, or any leaflet that, that you know from the movement. Mm -hmm. See how many times you see the, the phrase rights violations, or yeah. an explanation what it, what it means. You, you just won't find it. Yeah. Pe people are much more likely to talk about cruelty, you know, which essentially is a weak thing, you know, don't be cruel, right. you know. Or they might even beg for mercy. You know, I mean, one, one of the, um, the names I really dislike in the movement is Mercy for Animals. Mm. I think it's probably the weakest name you could ever think of, mm. you, know, when, when, you know. So we're not saying don't be cruel, weak, or have mercy for animals, weak. 
We are saying other animals are rights bearers and we don't have the right to violate their rights. It's a strong thing to say. Mm -hmm. And yet the movement, it's weird isn't it? The movement shies away from the strongest message and adopts the weakest message. And sometimes I think in our pursuit for strong language we use um, terms like murder, which I've actually come around to, I can see maybe longer conversations where we can dismantle the species of them mm. of, behind it, where maybe that'll work, however, for short conversations, why not just say rights violations? I think that's... Yeah, and also murder's got, murder's got a problem because people will, you know, it's like if people want to be offended, they will, they'll find a way of being, being thinking, so they'll go, oh, so you're saying I'm a murderer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, obviously they can, they, of, they can also yeah. say, oh, you're saying that I violate rights, are you? And the answer to that is, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's kind of a, it's an interesting one because I think it draw like I think you pointed out, it kind of draws people in, and instead of um, necessarily responding that way, it's kind of like, wait, what, what does rights mean? And, and it, to me, the biggest response I get is, oh, well, animals don't have rights. Mm. If I get a resistance, which is surprisingly quite small, I'd say maybe one out of eight people says that. Other times, people say, yeah, when we use them, we violate their rights, which even if they're not vegan. So. Yeah, I saw a video of you where, where you're asking that person, do you, do you think we're violating their rights? And, and, and people were quite openly said, yeah, I think we do. Yeah. Which, which is interesting, isn't it? You know, kind of like, you know, why, why would we do that? I, I had an interesting one um, just this last um, Wednesday before coming to VegFest. Uh, a couple came up to the stall in Dublin and we, we have some plant-based cheese samples. Uh -huh. And you can always tell whether somebody's going to dislike them. Whether they, whether they like it or not, they'll dislike it, you know. <laughs> you can tell by their face, you know. And but this, in this case, there was a couple. And one woman said, oh, I'm a vegan already, I, I must have a bit of your cheese. And she turned to her partner and she, she offered uh, this woman some cheese. She said, you probably won't like this. And the other woman kind of had a nibble of it. And she said, oh, that's horrible. And, and the, vegan, the vegan knew that, that her kind of partner was going to do that. And he said, oh, it's not, it's not as good as um, dairy cheese. I said, no, it's not as good as dairy cheese. It's better than dairy cheese. I said, because it's got no rights violations in it. You know? And normally that leads to the kind of conversations that, you, that, that you're, you're starting to have and everything. But she just said, uh, well, I like my cheese violated. <laughs> and walked off. <laughs> so which I, I didn't get too far with, <laughs> with, with that one. But I mean, if, if, it, if it had been a cruelty co um, conversation, she said, oh, I, I, I like cruel cheese and walked off. So Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I, uh, um, might, might as well aim, shoot, shoot for the stars and hopefully end up on the moon, right? <laughs> yeah, well, no, but I mean, I think it's a question of, if, if that's our position, we should talk about it. I mean, it's very similar to... I mean, one of, the, one of the things I always talk about is Donald Watson said that people need to be ripened up to new ideas. This new mm. fangled idea of, of veganism or animal rights, people have to be ripened up to it. The only way that they can be ripened up to it is if somebody talks to them about it. You know, Watson said that people are not going to magically arrive at veganism as an idea in their heads mm. unless somebody talks to them about it. Yep. And I think a lot of what we're talking around um, kind of is underpinning it is um, rethinking our language. Um, and, and removing the speciesism from it. Yeah, very important. Do, do you have any um, key resources that help you come up with new ideas? No, I mean, I'm, obviously, uh, I think we're both aware that there's, um, there's a Facebook group at the moment, mm -hmm. isn't there? Uh, Unlearning species language, and so that's where we're having these kind of conversations, kind of, about, you know, even to the extent is, do you think that is speciesist to, to say that? Because these things evolve. One, one, one thing that I use to um, illustrate the evolution of things is, is that we used to talk about pets and then in the 1980s we talked about companion animals and now we talk about animal companions. Mm -hmm. I remember Christopher Sebastian saying, oh yeah, I'm going to steal that because, you know, I'd been using, you know, companion animal, which is, which is now the common thing, the more, you know, the PC thing to say in the movement, but the actual better thing to say is animal companion. Mm -hmm. so, so language evolves as it should and a, a lang language evolves when it Takes, gets taken into a political arena, and that's what veganism is. It's a political arena, and mm. it's a social movement. And, and language is always very key for social movements. Mm -hmm. You know, sociologists see um, see social movements as um, claims makers. Mm. So that's obviously language based, because you know, we make claims. You know, we identify a problem, speciesism, cultural speciesism, our number one problem. We make then claims about it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and the cool thing for me about it is. 
I think, uh, I know as me as an animal advocate, I oftentimes feel a bit powerless to actually inspire change. I mean, I do loads of things that I think give me a better chance, mm. but to me, the words we choose to use, it's one of the easiest things to implement and perhaps one of the most effective, whether it's rights violations or you know, removing the species' implications. But you, but you might be being very powerful without knowing in the sense that mm. conversations plant seeds in people's minds. You know, and we, we get people coming back to us on the street and going, three months ago I came over and, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, we, I never thought of it that way. You know, a lot of people say that, you know, I never thought of it that way. And we also get a lot of people coming back and say, well, I'm, I'm vegan now. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we had a conversation with you four months ago. And then they went through the process, their journey. <laughs> Let's use that contentious <laughs> word, the, 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 the vegan journey. Actually, I don't mind that. That's going to be my next question. Tell oh, me about your the, vegan journey. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> it started in... <laughs> Well, I, I think just a shout out to Roger, he did a talk around um, in defense of revolutionary veganism mm. um, and just the importance of un at least understanding the history of the movement and those who helped form it and continue to, um, you know, with Reagan and so forth. Just building on that, where would you suggest people kind of start, um, obviously studying your work and some of the blogs you've written, where do you think would be like a great starting point for those who say, you know what, I don't actually understand the movement and I may not agree with everything, but I'd like to at least know what it stands for? Well, actually, if you, if you, if you put into Google um, the vegan 1945 or the vegan 1944, uh, all, all the vegan magazines from the vegan society are now archived. Oh, okay. And you can actually read them online. Okay. And it's, one of, it's one of those apps, I think it's called Issue. So it's kind of like uh, I-S-S-U-U. I think that's the website, and all all the magazines are. I think so. You you can actually read what the founders of our movement said right there. You don't have to have it be filtered through me. You know, my, people might say, "Oh, well, that Yates, you know, <laughs> uh, he's got an agenda." You know, that that, that has got an agenda, but but they they can read their own words, and that's what I use in my talks. I use their their words, mm. and I, you know, and of course there is obviously lots of talk about other things. You know, like. The growth of the movement. We got this letter from so and so, and somebody's somebody's worried about their their tomatoes and stuff. So they're going to have all that, right? But in in it, you can see you can almost like see over the first ten years the kind of evolution of this revolution. Yeah. That you know, I always I always a point I always make is that they tried to start a non-dairy section of the vegetarian society, right? And the vegetarians said no to that very politely, mm -hmm. and they also said you should. Break up, you know. Go, go, go on your own. You know, mm -hmm. you know, forge your own path and all that. And, and I, I came to the realization that wow, they really did the vegans a great favor by saying no, because that's what the vegans did. They go, okay, we strike out on our own. We, we, we think about our philosophy. We think about our values. And because of that title about the revolutionary thing, you know, I really do think that given the, the vision of the founders of our movement, our social movement. They were probably more radical and far-reaching than most modern-day vegans, and that's why I like to tell people about it because they, oh, you know, almost like that big. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, uh, you know, I, I think, I think, if you got veganism and you plug in the values of the founders, it's like pumping up a, a balloon. It makes it bigger, yeah. much more expansive, and really exciting. And I, th I, th I think their values are wonderful. Now, I also think, I understand this. You could dismiss it as utopian, and you could even dismiss it as not practical. But all big ideas you can do that with. Mm. You know? Yeah. That's it's a big, you know, veganism is a big idea. Articles, and I think for a lot of people out there that just want to get started, I think the articles, uh, the blogs you wrote for VegFest would be a great place. Maybe I'll link them yeah, in the video. I was, I was happy about, about that. And, and, and then I, maybe I, they can I go know, on. I know Tim, Tim Barter w w w was happy about it. And um, we, we did mean to do a couple more before it didn't get done, and I'm, I might do a couple after afterwards mm. because um, the idea was probably going to be to talk to the more recent vegans like like myself and Kim Stallwood. You know, um, I've already done Ronnie Lee, uh, and he was the last one so far, mm -hmm. and he went vegan in 1972. You know, so he was a he was a, a newcomer to the movement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and then you got Kim Stallwood in 1976, myself 1979. Um, so before that, it was all the people from the 40s, 50s, in, into the 60s. Um, and so now we, we were thinking, well, you know, we'll talk to the kind of people who are still around, mm -hmm. but started off relatively early, you know, and just ask them a couple of questions. So that might, might be, certainly that's one's in the pipeline. 
and maybe one, one or two others as well. We, we, we wanted to do one on veg, veg, um, veg farm. Now, veg farm is a brilliant organisation. It's kind of like Oxfam, so kind of like uh, aid for uh, you know in terms of food security, but it's all vegan. Oh, okay. Yeah, and not a lot of people know about it now. I don't but, know. Yeah, but it, I mean, it's so kind of, it's so kind of undercover now that um, it's difficult to find any information about it. So, mm. Mm, shame. Well, and uh, people like you can help bring it out there in the yeah. light. You mentioned new vegans. What would you say to those who really want to get started and maybe they just don't have the experience or maybe the, um, they're not inspired to kind of do public outreach? How would you encourage people to get started if they want to um, go beyond being vegan and starting to inspire change? Well, it's kind of suck it and see, really. I mean, like there, there are there are things. There's lots of things going on. I mean, if I if I just think about Ireland, there's a heck of a lot of things going on. Mm. But you know, there's probably more stuff going on in somewhere like uh, Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, some parts of it, you know, central parts, major cities and stuff. Uh, and so, whether you're thinking about uh, taking part in a kind of cube or an Earthlings experience, which is uh, less formal. Uh, I mean, I, I, I take part in Earthlings myself, mm -hmm. you know. I'm so militant, I can stand in the street with a, with, <laughs> with a laptop, people. That, that, that's how militant I am. Um, you know, and there's, there's also been things like Meet the Victims, you know, where there's uh -huh. been like an invasion of, of that. But then a, a lot of the stuff is revolved still, still around mm -hmm. kind of like single issues. There's, there's a campaign against greyhound racing at the moment, mm -hmm. you know. But again, it, that's kind of been influenced by vegans. So vegans are kind of prime movers there, you know. And then we've got the street work, mm -hmm. and in Dublin, that's that's mainly done by um, Vegan Information Project, but also Vigo, which stands for Vegan Education on the Go. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of there's a lot of different aspects that they can just try out and see what yeah. they, they feel. And what what you tend to get, you, see, you tend to see that people move from one to the other. Mm -hmm. they, they try one and they don't quite, it doesn't quite work for them and then they end up somewhere else. Yeah. So, that, you know, that, that's the way. Whilst they're doing that, I would say learn about the movement and the, and yeah. the movement's values. Because that will help you choose what you want to do anyway, but it also would inspire you in its own right. I mean, I think that, um, I think the values of the people who started the peace movement during World War II <laughs> You know, they declared peace during a global conflict. The, va the values of those people, which the, the official st historian of the vegan society calls anti-authoritarian, you know, these were radical people with, with a radical idea, and they are pretty awe-inspiring values. Yeah, I certainly use that line myself. Mm. Um, and I think just building on that, I well, think... What about the peace thing? The, the, yeah, in yeah the well, in the founding, I mean, yeah. It's a radical thing to do, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Mm. I mean, three of, them, three of them were conscientious objectors, you know? Mm. When I think building on just how to get active, I know I first started with more, the more street-oriented outreach and definitely studying the, the pioneers. The bulk of my um, advocacy at the moment is um, taking videos of animals at sanctuaries and then blasting that on social media. So I think there's lots of different ways we can help build awareness, obviously with the rights-based message. When it comes to critique, to me it's kind of a spectrum of this, these plea calls for unity, which could possibly lead to in the example of vegans merging with the vegetarian society, softening the message, mm. or also just generally keeping our thoughts to ourselves, to the other end, um, you know, criticizing, which I think has its place as well as unity, but to the point where it's unproductive and potentially toxic. And I'm just curious how you think we should um, approach both giving and receiving feedback and how we should deal with problematic organizations that may not respond well to feedback and evolving. Two, well, two kind of two well, questions stuck in yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, but you know, critique is incredibly important within the social movement because uh, one of the things that social movements do is move. That's one of the reasons yeah. why why they got that name. Uh, and so uh, another name would be reflexivity. That we we, we must we must um, we must kind of be ad adult enough to sa to sit down and say, are we, are we doing something that's right? Is there something that we can do that is different? You know, did that work? So a kind of tactical audit of, of, of our work. Don't just mm. take it as read that what we're doing kind of works. Mm. Um, you know, and, and we ought to be doing that almost like on a continuous basis. Uh, that really ought to be a central part of the movement discourse. Mm -hmm. um, some, some, peop some people kind of don't, um, don't take to that because they kind of take it personally. I think a point that you made that, uh, during the panel that some people might take it personally when it's not meant it's almost meant philosophically or, mm. you, know, you know, from a strategic point of view or something, you know. Um, 
And then there is, a, there is a thing now that people are getting a little bit tribalistic, I think, in the sense that, uh, you know, we've talked about issues like um, branding, and that, that, ca that came up uh, during this big thing, mm. which, which was quite good. And some people, quite, quite interestingly, were quite critical of it. Yeah. And, yeah, and going, oh, this kind of segregation into these things, and, you know, you've got to have the logo, me, me, me with my VIP uh, t t <laughs> It's t an animal t sanctuary, it's a, yeah. it skirts under that. Yeah, <laughs> so, but I mean, that's a fair point, I mean, it's a fair point, you know, all this kind of branding thing, you know, mm -hmm. fair point. Mm. Yeah. And I think also, to me, um, both separating complex issues, um, but also separating the issues from the individuals, um, I think, Talking about the actions versus um, if these people are good people or not, I think is because I think that helps remove that chance well, of feeling attacked. That's a fascinating question and fascinating point. The problem at the moment is we've got issues which are, seem to be embedded in individuals. Mm. So the the idea becomes associated with the individuals, right? And so this is where this kind of celeb cultural thing comes in. And again, as a sociologist, we have a society which is drenched with celebrity culture. Mm -hmm. I'm actually quite surprised because we're supposed to be, as vegans, critical thinkers. I'm actually quite surprised that celeb culture has embedded itself into veganism as much as it mm. has. I, I kind of, in a way, didn't see it coming. And I was talking, funny enough, for, for, for that blog entry I was talking about, about Ronnie Lee, I was saying to him, because we did a Skype uh, thing just to kind of catch up, and I said, you know, in our generation, we didn't actually we didn't actually think about making money and becoming famous. Mm. You know, kind of like, I, I sometimes wonder if, if modern day vegans think, you know, what schmucks you were, you know, kind of, you, know, you could have been famous, you could have been rich, you know, and we never thought about it. Yeah. You know, so the idea of kind of being famous as an individual and then branding it mm. never occurred to us. It was about the cause, not the brand for us. And, and I find that personally struggling because I, um, I feel very awkward promoting even um, videos of, anim of our animal cousins that I've made because it feels self promoting but there, there almost needs to be an element of that strategically mm -hmm. done. Obviously, my, the key for me is centering the animals through that because if we don't promote ourselves, you know, through our sharing, and, but that's, I think we need to do this mindfully, I think is the key there. Mindfully, certainly. I mean, there was a controversy, without mentioning any names, very recently, of someone virtually kind of taking a selfie with slaughter mm. taking part behind them. Mm. And that caused outrage, rightly really, in the movement. Because, it, you know, we've all got that thing, it's not, it's not about us, it's about them and all that. I mean, that, mm. that, I mean, that point came up when we were talking about burnout earlier. And, and it is true, I mean, you know, we're not the victims here, you know. And so, um, yeah, I, th I think that, um, Actually, the, j just to be on another serious note about that, one thing that we did in my generation was we, we kind of shared things around. So if, if a journalist contacted me and said, we want you to talk about X, Y, and Z, and I knew somebody who could do it better, mm. we would pass that on. At the moment, the kind of people who have set themselves up as spokespersons for the movement, they're taking everything, even if they don't know much about it. There's a, mm. ca a case about six months ago where some, probably less than six months actually, where somebody took, took a call about an issue that they didn't know anything about, you know, and what they should have done is pass it on. Mm -hmm. We're a movement, it's a cause. It's not about your personal clicks and yeah. stuff like that, you know, it's not about YouTube, it's about the cause, you know. I think, I think fundamentally we have to remember that, that you know, uh, it's not about being an entrepreneur or anything. Yeah. It's about animal liberation, it's about animal rights. That's ultimately the, the base thing. It's about veganism, it's about revolutionary veganism. Um, what you've got to do along the way, we can talk about, but it's not really about becoming famous, it's not be about being rich, that's not what it's about. Yeah, yeah and I think uh, um, a couple of things are popping up to my head as we're discussing. I think vegans or not, it's important to have a bit of humility and um, being willing to say we have something to learn. Um, because I, I, I think veganism isn't the end for a lot of us, or it shouldn't be at least, it's, it's the beginning. And to be willing to continue to explore new ideas, both you know, as a movement, but also our individual conversations, because I think people expect us to just kind of talk at them and um, have this, um, you know, basically just lecture. And I think when we go into it and say, hey, actually, what are your thoughts? What can, you, what can I learn from you about this topic? Mm. I think that's why there's a lot of these barriers of critique within the, 
um, vegan circles themselves because people are like, yep, I'm vegan, I've got my opinions on it, and that's it. And then oh, it's... no, we're, we're all teaching, we're all learning. But, you know, part of teaching is learning. You can't teach yeah. if you don't learn. Mm -hmm. And you, you, it, doesn't, it doesn't kind of stop. I mean, it, it, do, it kind of does a kind of top professor level. Mm -hmm. But when you're actually teaching, you're learning as well. Going, going back to how you started that, I don't tend to think about beginners as being the, the start or the end of anything. I just see it as a central core to everything that we do continuously. Mm. That's, that's the way I think about it. That's a good way to look at it too, yeah. Mm. Just the last thing to wrap it up. Um, one thing that I'd like to ask um, throughout is, and final, is if you had to say anything to all the animal advocates out there, um, what would it be? I would say, you know, this is a good time uh, for veganism. And in, you know, to put my kind of academic head on it for a while, you know, we're, we're at kind of movement takeoff now. But that does bring about some dangers as well. It's a dangerous time, but it's a very exciting time. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say is that you're, you're really coming into a movement which is, which is in a really kind of interesting time. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting time and it's a dangerous time. And going back to my kind of theme, is if you kind of learn about the values of the movement, it, I think it will help you navigate yourself through all that because there's going to be a lot of things happening now which have not happened before. Like you're going to have big capitalist industries coming in and going, well, we want a slice of this vegan pie and all this kind of stuff. And we, we're going to have to think, okay, how do we, how do we react to, you know, Mac vegan and all that kind of stuff, right? Because it's an inevitable thing that's going to happen, but it's also a bit of a threat. I mean, my generation it was easy. McDonald's was just part of the enemy. You know, check out Mac Libel on YouTube, a brilliant documentary. Uh, you know, my generation would just have nothing to do with, 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 with McDonald's, you know. Mm. And um, my generation, including myself, would, would probably say we probably shouldn't have much to do with them now because in, in a kind of pro-intersectional sense, it, it's not good. Oh, th thank you. I really, really appreciate following your work. It's really, I know, inspired me. So um, the last thing I'd say is just to check out Roger's work because that'll link you on to Reagan's work. and. I think both of us um, passionately passionate about that, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because I think it's more effective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I'd endorse all of that, you know. Mm -hmm. And also, we are the animal rights movement, and it's always been a mystery to me. Actually, I see it as um, <laughs> just, just, I know we're a bit, you know, we're supposed to start uh, finish on a high note, but I mean, on a, on, <laughs> on a serious. On a serious note, I don't actually think it's fair for people who don't believe in the philosophy of animal rights to call themselves animal rights people because there are some people who want to ground their position on other animals and human rights and everything else on the basis of the theory of animal rights. Mm. And we, in that position, we never get heard because we're drowned out by people who take the name but not the philosophy. I don't actually think that's fair. If you, if you don't believe in the philosophy, don't take the goddamn name. Well, it's kind of mm -hmm. a catch-22, isn't it? Because at least even, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here, I'm, I'm, I, I may regret saying this, <laughs> but I mean, even if people don't understand it, they're at least getting the, the words animal rights out there, and if the people no, who actually... No, that's a danger though. Is it, well, if, you, if you get a dis distorted version, what's the point of that? I guess to me, if oh, the, only the people who truly read the 400 ca pa uh, pages of the case for animal rights and, and other similar works, they were the only ones that used the terminology, I don't think people know it even exists. I, 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 I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's a perfect solution, but I'm just saying, just playing devil's advocate, it, you know, it's, it's getting it out there and, 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 and here's another thought. Some of these organizations that chuck around animal rights but don't necessarily um, fully embraced or understood the, the underpinning philosophy are now starting to look into it. And if they kicked it to the curb from the start because um, it wasn't being used, I'm not I talking think, about kicking it to the curb. I'm just talking about true. I mean, no, I'm not again, talking about ironically, we're talking about yeah. labels here. So, yeah, yeah. It you comes know, back to language, see, doesn't it? Yeah, but it seems to me that if somebody wants to check out animal rights, if they're then directed to animal rights, that seems to be a lot better than if they want to check out animal rights and they get taken to animal welfare or something or something else. Uh, yeah. And so they, they then they then kind of then, oh, I'm now an animal rights person. And they don't actually know what it is. That seems to me to, to be not great either. I'm, yeah. not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about marginalizing the rights-based people. 
I don't really want to kind of reduce the number. I'd like to ex sure. expand the number. And the way to expand the number is to expose people who are interested in animal rights to animal rights, seems mm. to me. And once that's done, we might be in danger of starting an animal rights movement. <laughs> God know? forbid, an animal yeah, rights movement that I talks know. about animal yeah, rights. I mean, right? wouldn't that be revolutionary, you know, in itself? You know? I mean, <laughs> instead of just having a movement that calls itself that, we actually have a movement that is based on animal rights, which makes animal rights claims, which then means, you see, the point is, it's all about, it's all about the fact that the public need to assess ideas. We're back to, to, to Watson and ripening up. Mm. It, it, people cannot assess an idea until they learn about it. Mm. And they won't learn about it until somebody who knows about it already tells them about it. What we've got at the moment is people who don't know what it means telling them that this is, this is what animal rights means and it's not, it's not really correct. It's not kind of philosophically correct. Whether that, you know, we could argue, I suppose, whether that's important or not, but I, mean, I, th I think it is. In, 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 I'm going to use um, a very wise person uh, has pointed out to me the difference between focus and scope. And I think, I guess going back to what we said earlier, um, you, you mentioned kind of, you know, if we want to um, understand animal rights, go to the, where the animal rights information is. And I think one thing you've put me on to is during the Singer days, um, we adopted the animal rights movement and without actually animal rights messaging underpinning it. We adopted if, the if name we, of it, we like the name. See, it, people have yeah. said to me over the years, well, I use the, the word animal rights because I don't want to be called animal welfare. They, mm. they, they see that as a pejorative, right? Uh, but the ironic thing is their language is welfare mm. and they'll, they'll quickly slide into welfare too because they, they've never really had the kind of learning to keep them in the rights Mm. area you 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 know you you've got to kind of study it a little bit mm. and that and that stops you kind of sliding into welfare because as a sociologist again i i can say that um, we're we're born into a very deeply culturally species society and mm. part of part of that learning is the ideology of animal welfare and the ideology of animal welfare says that non cruel use is feasible and not only feasible but common mm. right so that so that so that's their default position and the cornerstone concept of animal welfare is unnecessary suffering not causing unnecessary suffering which already builds into the fact that some of it is necessary mm. what that means is it's necessary to get this exploitation done mm. that, that you know so so animal welfare as an ideology which which we all um, kind of teach each other and our kids is exploitative in the first place mm. To stand outside of that, you need to know what the alternative is, rather rather than being in a situation where you keep getting dragged into it. Like, like you know, we talk about language, and you know, people people will, will talk to you, and they'll be bringing it back to their comfort zone, which is talking about cruelty. Mm. They do that within the movement and without the mo mm. movement, right? So right. the people on the street will do it. Well, you know, well, let's talk about cruelty, and we say, well, we we want to talk about animal rights, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's cruel, though, is it? You know, so. You know they, they've got they've got it. They're trying to they're trying to find find a, a framework. The framework they know is animal welfare. Mm. We have to teach them animal rights, and that goes within the movement too. Yeah. Uh, and we so far we've not you know we've had a, a brilliant advocate for animal rights in Tom Reagan, mm. but in a sense he failed. He failed to spread it within the movement, and I say that's because he was marginalised deliberately marginalized. I, I, think, I think this movement treated Tom Reagan appallingly. Mm. I really do. I think it was shocking what we did mm. to Tom Reagan. You know, he's only just been inducted into the Animal Rights Hall of Fame. And he Tom Reagan. He created the bloody thing. Yeah. <laughs> Practically. <laughs> yeah. And he, he was dead before they inducted him. Which is a tra yeah, that's tragic in itself. Well, that's a scandal, man. Yeah, you know, that that yeah. is absolutely disgusting. Mm. You know? And I guess that's why I, I, uh, I, I'm definitely going to reflect on this more on the train ride home because I'm not super fixed in this. I just can't help but wonder if this misguided adaptation of the, the animal rights movement is, has some underpinning benefits just because there's, you know, we're talking about 1% of the population being vegan, 1% being active, and then maybe 1% of that that takes a right base, rights of right base approach. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, barely stumbled onto it myself if it weren't for a few key influences. So mm. I just can't help but wonder if we removed, you know, if we just call it the animal movement, you know, take out rights or welfare. If we just call it the animal movement, I think we'd be talking a lot less about rights. 
Um, but I agree it should be done mindfully no, and call, understand No, if you call it the animal movement, the default position would be welfare, so it would become the animal welfare movement. Effectively, yeah, that's yeah. a fair point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think... No, I mean, we, we've almost got to stand as a, as a vanguard and, and actually stand with our kind of animal rights flag and say, no, come over here, uh, uh, because, you know, th th this, this is, this is the, yeah. the way forward. And this is the more radical thing. See, I go, True, I go, I go back to the fact line. that, yeah, yeah. I go I back to that. the, I mean, we're claims makers. The strong, you know, do we want to make our strongest claim or do we want to make our weakest claim? Yeah. We can argue about whether that's true. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, you see, a lot of people think that learning about animal rights is complicated. It's a bit abstract. You know, people don't know about rights, and, uh, but they do know about cruelty. Mm. But I think from what I've seen about your work and what I've seen ab about my own experiences, that that's not even true. Mm. You, can, you can quite easily talk to people about rights. Mm. They, won't, they won't fall off their chair if you start talking to them about, mm. about rights. Well, mm. And what's the harm in trying? So there you have it. There's our chat. I'd love to hear what people think about some of these topics, so be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments. I'd especially like to hear what you think about that topic that kind of snuck up a little bit at the end there. Here's Johnny! <laughs> Do you think we should reserve the term animal rights for those who have done an in-depth study of the philosophy of animal rights? Or do you think it's okay for some people to use a term that may not fully understand it in the hopes that they one day will? As you could probably tell from the video, I wasn't that sure about this myself. At the moment, I feel like the focus of animal rights is centering our animal cousins, so as long as our advocacy centers around them, it's a start to discussing animal rights. While I appreciate the scope of animal rights is quite vast and can include a variety of different topics. I agree, Roger. We should talk more about rights violations. Thank you for watching and for your support. I know it means the world to me. And let's see if we can keep this dialogue going in the comments section. Do you want to miss out on the next video? I didn't think so. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. See you in the next video. I'll ask you the first question. Well, how was your day, Jeremy? <laughs> oh, it was fine. How was your day? <laughs> <laughs> no, we get straight to the good stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> If you're happy, I'll just lightning, lightning round you a few questions and see what you have to think. Yeah, shoot. <laughs> what does animal rights mean to you and how do you think we should advocate for them? <laughs> oh, the hard ones first, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, no, they, they get hard, don't worry. Oh, is <laughs> yeah, there's a great goon show joke where um, somebody asks Milligan what his name is. He says, oh, the hard ones first, eh? Yeah, that's, um... I have two, maybe two more questions and then um, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Only two. Um... <laughs> And you go to them and say, which part of the case for animal rights do you like the most? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, no, I just sit there and read the case for the animal rights. The, the, the no, animals. that's a great one. Yeah, I never thought of that one. That's a good one. Yeah, I like that one. Um, so yeah, just different ways to get involved. I'm Funny not... enough, I reckon people would watch you reading them, reading that to other animals. Before rather... actually. <laughs> It's it's a, yeah, I mean, that would work, wouldn't it? That's what I've been doing with Alexis, and people don't want to listen to me, but they, yeah, they might yeah, listen to... Yeah, it, it would work. If you're the sociologist, I, I that... it would work, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's kind of like, it takes the... F. Oh, I don't know, it's really... That's interesting, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could easily do this for another couple hours. We've, we've done podcasts together nearly two hours, so we, we know how to talk. We've been but... talking for two days, folks. <laughs> And we may get kicked out of the building here soon, so this yeah, is a bit cheeky thing, what yeah. we're doing, but yeah, a, I don't see any yellow yeah. vests coming towards us. <laughs> Outside but. of the frame, there's all these people <laughs> clearing up and <laughs> taking equipment away and all kinds. We're pretending we're holding each other captive. Yeah, I know, yeah. Um, <laughs> if you had to say anything to all the animal advocates out there, um, what would it be? Oh, that's a terrible last question, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> God, what, what, what do you say? I mean, where do you start? It, it's not good. Put it that way. I mean, I, I was tempted to swear there, folks. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the badges that we've got. I, I, I say you swear, and then we'll see how many people comment on it. Yeah, and my they, dogs we are full of shit, whole... people. Don't, don't, don't go anywhere near, near it. In fact, I tell you what, in our generation, we used to go to McDonald's to go to the toilet. We, but we always used to go with quick drying cement. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that might not make the cut. <laughs> So all the new advocates out there, yeah. they're looking for what to quick, do. Quick drying cement. That's what you do. And get it from all the builder su suppliers, yeah. So I have to ask, do they go to the bathroom before or after the quick dry cement? <laughs> no, you go, you go to the bathroom in order to employ the... <laughs> I'm just wondering if there's another yeah, layer no, no, it, I mean, it could be. Yeah, the, 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 the actual biological function doesn't come into it. <laughs> well, if you're, if you're gonna shit on a corporation, I mean... Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yes, see, we know. I thought we could have done a dirty protest that thing. We never thought of that. That would be too. That would be too much. I think. It even happen anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Maybe we just leave it there because I saw a message on my camera. So hopefully it's. Um... Right. It's my turn to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Roger. Really appreciate it. Yeah, you're so. welcome, man. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure meeting you. So. Yes. Thanks for watching and for more resources and support, check out veganinteractions.com and check out Challenge 22 on Facebook for free support to get started with veganism.